Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to this session looking at creating danger for sex workers through bad laws, not just end-demand laws. Um, I'm Ruth Morgan Thomas. I'm Global Coordinator of the Global Network of Sex Work Projects, which is a network of sex worker-led organizations in 84 countries around the world. And we chose, along with our regional and local partners, so the International Committee for the Rights of Sex Workers in Europe and the Sex Worker Rights and Advocacy Network, and PROUD as a local Dutch sex worker-led organization, we've chosen to focus all of our efforts on looking at the impact of punitive laws on our communities. And our communities are very diverse. The intersectionality with other key populations is very clearly there. We have migrant sex workers who are both documented and undocumented, all of whom experience different levels of oppression through bad laws, policies, and practices. So I was delighted to be asked to come and co-chair a session looking specifically at the harms that laws are creating in terms of the end-demand laws that we are experiencing increasingly around the world. I think that we have to realize that the criminalization of consensual adult sex can never be justified. And I think that we also have to recognize that it creates an extreme oppression on my community around the world. We only have three countries where we have decriminalization of sex work. And so I'm looking forward to hearing the evidence from the various presenters today. And I would like to ask Catherine Hutter from USA, from John Hopkins University, to start with the first of the presentations. everyone. Uh, so this morning I'm going to be presenting findings from a recently completed cohort study with sex workers. Not hear me very well. Up oh, there we go. I'm going to be presenting findings from a recently completed cohort study with sex workers in the US. And the study specifically focused on women's experiences with the police. And today we're looking at police policing's impact on women's experience of client violence. So female sex workers' work environment can increase women's vulnerability in a number of ways. Um, an important aspect is their exposure to violence. So between 45 to 75% of female sex workers experience violence in the workplace, and that's particularly true of street-based sex workers. So today's focus is on client violence, but there are other perpetrators, including intimate partners and other third parties. Types of violence include physical, verbal, and sexual abuse, and studies show a number of negative health-related outcomes, including substance use, depression, PTSD, and of course the acquisition of STI and HIV. So thinking about the role of the police, uh, this slide says police should have a custodial role in protecting women, meaning that police should proactively be addressing calls for service, related incidents of violence, promoting trust with female sex workers so they feel able to report violence and not themselves being the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. However, in this setting and in many others, police fail for short um, in this custodial role. Uh, criminalization of sex work tends to provide police with the power and legitimacy to impose a variety of practices that increase women's vulnerability to poor health-related outcomes, including violence. Evidence suggests that negative policing practices, abusive and enforcement approaches can shift women to less safe areas, cause them to rush negotiations, increasing the risk of bad client experiences. But the evidence base is limited and largely reliant on qualitative studies. And many study, studies only look at police as a secondary outcome. So for that reason, the SAFFIRE study Sapphire standing for sex workers and police promoting health in risky environments was a study that looked to specifically focus on women's experiences and interactions with the police. And we conducted this study in Baltimore City. It's the 29th uh, biggest city in the US. It wasn't the top 10 until the 1980s, but it's gone, undergone a huge economic shrinkage 
which has also seen a huge rise in drug dealing and gang-related violence. Uh, 51 murders per 100,000 in 2016, and I give a comparison there with Amsterdam, which has two, or New York, which has three. Uh, one in 10 adults addicted to heroin, and I say they're strained police-community relations, which were particularly acute at the time of this study, uh, given the death of Freddie Gray, a young black man in police custody. So for this study, we used targeted sampling to identify hotspots throughout Baltimore City where there was a concentration of street-based sex work. We had a mobile study van that visited these hotspots and recruited women from the street. Uh, women who were eligible and willing to undergo consent completed a CAPI uh, interview administered questionnaire. To measure client violence, we used the revised conflict tactic scale which asked whether women had been hit, punched, slapped, or otherwise physically hurt or threatened, or been forcibly pressured to have vaginal or anal sex when they didn't want to by a client. So before moving to look at the results, just to give you an idea of how we came up with our police measures. We initially did a systematic uh, review of the literature of quantitative studies to better understand how other contexts had measured and captured policing. We actually conducted an on-the-ground police ethnography in Baltimore City, so conducting rideouts across a year to better understand how policing happens in this particular context. And we also had a Sapphire Study Community Advisory Board made up of current and former sex workers. So moving then to the types of police interactions we looked at. We separated them into two types, patrol practices, <clears throat> so things like <coughs> Regular everyday interactions like moving women along, routine stops, confiscating drugs and drug paraphernalia, conducting a search of a woman's property, and arrest. And then for abusive practices, we had things like verbal emotional harassment, sexual harassment and assault, physical violence, pressuring women to have sex, and police as clients. Now, clearly the division between these two groups isn't completely clear-cut, but the attempt was to discriminate between blatantly egregious practices and more routine day-to-day -day enforcement practices that are at least standard practice from the police, police's perspective. So moving then to the results, we recruited 250 women, a variety of ages, but a slightly older mean age of 36. A very white population, given the context, 66%. A very structurally vulnerable population, I've just shown there, 62% homeless in the last three months. And a high street presence and daily engagement in sex work. And really importantly, 70% of these women used heroin daily. So looking first at the frequency of patrol practices, you can see from this figure that women had a lot of exposure to the police. 80% of women having at least one patrol police encounter and 60% having at least two in the last three months. And you can see that the most commonly experienced patrol practices were those associated with displacing women, with a third of women reporting being moved along on at least a weekly basis. Drug confiscation was also very high, uh, but interestingly, condom confiscation was rare in the setting, which actually isn't the case in, in other US cities. So the, looking at the frequency of abusive practices, so compared to patrol, they were less frequent, but still 80% of women had experienced an abusive police practice in their lifetime, and 40% had done so in the prior three months, and 10% did so on a weekly ba basis. And the most common types were verbal emotional harassment and sexual harassment and abuse. So having looked at these different types of police exposure, we can ask what their association is with women's experience of client violence. So here we have two graphs where the y-axis is the percent of women who had experienced client violence in the prior three months, and the x-axis is the number of different practices experienced by those women. And we see that for both patrol on the left and abusive on the right, there is a clear relationship between the two. So the more police exposure is associated with an increased risk of client violence. And importantly here, we're looking at an increase for each additional type of interaction. So we can build regressions that explore the factors that are associated with recent client violence. 
And when considering each of these different police indicators that we came up with, on their own, nearly all were associated with crime violence. So you can see there 10 out of the 14 different measures. However, it's not, we think, likely that individual behaviors, uh, but more aggregate police interactions are what leads to this environment that facilitates client violence. So for that reason, we uh, did an adjusted analysis where we collapsed our patrol enforcement indicators and our abusive practices into two aggregate measures. And in doing this, we found that for both abusive and patrol, each additional experience of a practice resulted in an approximately 30% increase in the odds of client violence. And that's even after adjusting for factors like time in sex work and drug use. Although you can see that for patrol practices, it was marginally non-significant. So to finish off, I just thought it was useful to kind of focus in on the drugs piece a little. Uh, women's risk environment is obviously very complex, but it's particularly so when women inject drugs. And in this setting, we could say that it's really the drug use that was driving women's interactions with the police, not their involvement in sex work. And this graph shows really how female sex workers who use heroin daily had twice as many exposures with police than female sex workers who did not for both types of policing. And interestingly, in the bivariate analysis, uh, female sex workers who use drugs were 2.4 times more likely to experience client violence than those that did not. But when we controlled for, adjusted for police exposures, that relationship went away. So it suggests that maybe police are mediating at least some of the relationship between women's drug use and client violence. <coughs> So in conclusion, female sex workers in the setting are frequently exposed to both routine and abusive police interactions. Police behaviors appear to facilitate a risk environment in which client violence occurs. And female sex workers who inject drugs have both more police encounters and experience far greater levels of client violence. So thinking about the application of these findings, being able to quantify the frequency and type of police uh, behaviors and their associations with client violence really provides a very important entry point for discussions with the police at a local level, as well as policymakers at a state or national level. Police policies that prioritize female sex workers' safety can over time change cultural norms, particularly if coupled with police sensitivity trainings. So in this setting, for instance, the police were very interested in the idea of a sex worker community liaison officer who could try and facilitate better relations with the community. And finally, it's crucial that alongside police reform, women themselves are supported and empowered to report client violence and police abuse. And in Baltimore, um, a new drop-in center created for female sex workers by a follow-up grant hopes to do just this, and that's the Spark Center. So it just remains to acknowledge the amazing Sapphire Field staff who collected all this data. It was a huge, huge effort, and of course the participants, the women who gave up their time. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, um, Catherine. We're going to save all the questions for the end. I should just introduce myself. My name is Lisa Maher. I'm a professor at the Kirby Institute for Infection and Immunity in Sydney in Australia. I know a little bit about this area. I've been doing research on, um, I guess, criminalization and legal over-regulation of uh, vulnerable groups for about three decades. Our next speaker is from South Africa. His name is Tashwell Esterheisen. He's a graduate from the University of Cape Town. He leads the LGBTI and Sex Workers' Rights Program at the Southern Africa Litigation Center, and he has extensive experience in public interest and human rights litigation and advocacy in 10 Southern African countries. Welcome. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tashwa, as I was introduced. Um, I'm from the Southern African Litigation Center, where I'm the LGBT and Sex Worker Rights Program. Just to give a brief background of the organization, we, an, uh, um, we, an, um, we provide litigation support to grassroots activists and organizations within Southern Africa. So we provide, we work in the, the, in the region, in the 10 African countries, and mainly we provide um, litigation support. But our methodology is to first start off with a broader community engagement and, um, and 
after that engagement, um, um, engaging with the government. And it's only once those engagement has failed that activists have turned to the courts for, um, for recognition. So the purpose of this study is because we've been working with sex worker organization in Zambia. And they've asked us to do some preliminary research that we can use for the purpose to guide our litigation, but also so that we can engage with the, um, with the government of where the, um, 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 the, the issues um, 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 mainly lies within Zambia. And we were focusing in, in sex workers within, um, in Lusaka, which is the capital um, in, in Zambia. So the aim of the research is to understand the experience of sex, sex workers and their vulnerability in terms of discrimination, harassment, and sexual abuse by police officials. In particular, the research aimed to understand, to, aims to establish from sex workers in Zambia how police abuse has affected them. This is a preliminary assessment, um, which, is pre prelim which is primarily aimed to assist us as an organization and to guide the sex workers on how we should approach the litigation, and also um, to develop an advocacy strategy for, um, for the litigation. So obviously, because this is a, the, the purpose of the research, as I said in the beginning, our, per, our methodology is to, before we embark in litigation, to have our own understanding from an organization, but also from the grassroots organization themselves of where to guide the research. So they obviously, this is not aimed to have a broad understanding of what the actual impact is, but it's aimed to, to guide us as an organization and also the organization that we work with. Um, so what we've realized that when we engage with some of the, 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 um, the sex workers, there was a very limited understanding and definition of rape. Um, so when we, and because in the, in the, there was not a, clear, a proper um, translation for rape within the, the local language. And also um, people understood rape differently. So if for, for some sex workers, when they, um, they would see if the police targeted them and they arrest them and they said, okay, give me sexual <laughs> favors and I will release you. Some of them didn't consider that as rape, but merely as a way to get out and to protect himself and not spend the night in jail. So, and, and I think that was, was a, 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 a problematic, was even when we, try, when, when, um, when, when we tried to engage, they would say, no, but it wasn't rape, I consented because I wanted to go out, I wanted to leave um, prison, or I didn't want it to be arrested. So that was a, 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 was a big issue. And also, we only had 39 sex workers in Lusaka. Again, this is not supposed to be a general um, under, um, um, overview. This is about, it's, it's supposed to guide us as an organization, and also the organization itself, what the most problematic areas are. And initially, when we designed the questions with the director of the organizations, um, it was in English, and it was later translated to the local language. We, th we think that's a, a bit of a problem because, uh, as I said, there's not sometimes direct translation to the, um, 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 in, um, um, in the local language. And also, we didn't um, uh, interact with the police about the, um, about in the report. We engaged with them subsequent report, but in the drafting of the report, we didn't because it, at the sex workers at this moment just wanted them to, we wanted we, to use this for our, to guide us. So I'm just going to go through briefly through the, um, through the, um, through some of the, the findings. Again, these are not, it's not the, the, the findings are, um, it's not the purpose of this litigation, um, about this um, presentation, but more again, what guided us as a strategy. 90% of the, of the women were treated um, poorly, 87% um, have been harassed, 90% um, has experienced violence, and 61% and refused to lay a complaint whenever they've, um, whenever they've been harassed by the police. And again, as we know, they do that because they're afraid that they might be arrested once they, they do so. I'm just going to skip through some of the findings because I actually want to go through with the, the actual strategy that we've been used with some of this, um, the, this, the, the sex worker organization in Zambia. So, so interesting, throughout Southern Africa, South Africa, where I'm from, is the only country that actually criminalizes um, um, sex work outright. Um, it, which is quite ironic because South Africa has a very progressive constitution. But the other countries throughout the region, 
criminalize the activities around sex work. So a lot of the time people would say sex work is criminalized, sex work is um, in, the, in the country, but it's not. But what has actually been used in these countries um, is the vagrancy laws, the petty offenses laws to target sex workers. So what what the what if we the strategy that we're trying to be used with some of the organizations is to remove those laws and not in to, to use the laws by in, in sex work itself but to find ways around the um to um to, to use to remove the laws but not actually telling the court that it actually engaged with sex worker with sex work so for example we've we've had one case in which um, we've been wanting to remove um, the vagrancy laws. It's like this old dated law where if you are seen walking into the street from one space to the other, then you, and you can't, um, you, you can't explain yourself, then the police would target you and harass, um, arrest you. So we wanted to remove that laws for a long time. We thought it would be an opportunity because these laws are, also, um, are not only used for sex workers, but it's also used for LGBT people, for, for transgender individuals. So we thought, okay, we need to find a way to remove the laws. So then there was uh, one individual who was um, a beggar, and he was walking from the one, um, he, um, he didn't have um, um, a car, and he was walking from one part of the country to the other, and then the police ex uh, um, 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 arrested him for um, saying that he couldn't explain himself. And then we thought this was a crucial opportunity to, to challenge the constitutionality of these law, this law. Because again, it hasn't, it, it, it's, it's something different because sex work is still a very sensitive topic in the country. So it, by removing this law by the facts, we could, it could also then be, um, 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 positively affect sex workers. So we went to court and said that um, this is an unlawful targeting of poor people. Because obviously as a wealthy person, you would never have to walk from one part of the country to the other. And on that basis, we then removed the laws and the court agreed with us that the law is unconstitutional because um, 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 it's target poor people. So again, we use different facts, even though it, we, the laws are still targeting sex workers, but try to find the laws where the courts are more um, empathetic towards the client. Um, 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 uh, um, or the facts with the courts are more empathetic towards the client. We've, we've also had another case where, we've, where, we, um, where sex workers were arrested in, um, um, for living on the earnings of sex work. And again, it's a very difficult offense to prove, but the police consistently targeted and arrested sex workers on, the, on this offense. We then went to, so the, the sex workers went to court and um, they were found, they pleaded guilty, they were unrepresented. And it was at this stage that the organization reached out to us to, um, to provide them legal support. We then went to court to say that um, the due process has not been followed. So instead of targeting the, uh, two, we, we went from two bases, due process has not been followed, but also the fact that the law itself, as we, from the Canadian case, that the law itself doesn't target sex workers, that they're actually there to protect sex workers it, from exploitation. And then the court then agreed with us that the laws on living of the, on the earnings are actually there to uh, protect sex workers against um, exploitation. So now we're trying to find laws around these laws that doesn't target sex work itself, but to remove the vagrancy laws from the um, um, from the from the from the from the from the, from the um, law books, because throughout the region, sex workers are being criminalised and targeted by these laws, even though they not sex workers not criminalised outright. The same example of a case that we dealt with in in in, in Zambia, where sex workers were um, arrested, and then in court. Um, they, they were arrested and immediately afterwards they, were, um, they took, took them to the hospital and did HIV testing. And in Zambia, if you have HIV, it enhanced the criminal sentence because you should have known better. 
And so what the, 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 the state did, they, for the first time, the, some, many of the sex workers heard about their status in court. So the police um, um, tested them, and then in court said to the, the magistrate that this person was tested HIV positive, and therefore we would want an enhanced sentence. So for many of the sex workers, they only heard the status in court. Again, we went to court and, and challenged the, the provision relating to w consent. Whether, when can you consent to t testing of, 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 of um, um, informed consent? The court agreed with us, and then that, that practice was removed. So because of the, the system that's been highly stigmatized against sex workers, we're trying to find ways where we can find fund, we, we, where we can assert the fundamental rights of sex workers, but through different mechanisms, um, alternative means to affirm to the court that everybody has a right to dignity, the right to um, and privacy, and, and that also that the state cannot make bare assertions and, and, and without evidence. In, the, in many cases, when they arrest people with, with, with living on the earnings, it's a, it's a fundamental principle of, 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 of the law that when you arrest someone, you need to bring evidence to have the claim. You can't just arrest them. And sex workers are no different. So activists in the region has tried to find innovative ways of trying to affirm their rights and their dignity without challenging the law because the conversation in the, in the region is not there yet. So, so I would like to thank all of the activists for, um, for their hard work and the activists that we've been working with in the region. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite Sally Hendricks, who is the program lead for the sex work program at AIDS Funds here in the Netherlands, and Dina Bonds, who is from Proud and sits on their board, as well as their LGBT coordinator. They're going to present some of the research that's been done here in the Netherlands. illustrate how stigma translates into violence as being a sex worker. Um, I'm a sex worker in the windows um, and I only work two days a week and my apartment is one street over from where I work. So a lot of the stigma from sex workers is you know we're slutty or we always want to have sex and you know the typical whores thing uh, and so I have to kind of wait after I get off work um, and make sure that there's no clients around before I walk to my apartment uh, because I have a really great fear that one of my potential clients or one of the people that I've sent away and is not my client uh, might follow me home. Uh, you know, I've actually had someone do that and I woke up the next day and my upstairs neighbors were really angry because someone had egged, like threw raw eggs uh, at our door and was yelling whore outside of my window for like two hours one night. This was a short section from the inter interviews we conducted in the Netherlands in our research on stigma and violence. Violence can be a major risk for HIV and STIs and is a major driver for the epidemic. Under the hands of program, we conducted a research together with sex workers in five Southern African countries. After seeing the results, we in the Netherlands saw the need to also conduct the same study here. Because worldwide, people have the idea, the preconceived idea that in the Netherlands, where sex work is legalized, there is no stigma and violence. Our research, however, shows the contrary. Many people have been involved in this research, but I would like to mention a couple of people in particular. First of all, Marianne Jonker, who is unfortunately ill and is not here to present today. But also the researchers, Marielle Kluck and Minke Dijkstra, uh, who are sitting here in the front row, 
and they will show you um, the report, the full report later. The research um, was set up participatory, meaning that, this research, that the research design, the development of the questionnaires, the data collection, and the interpretation was undertaken jointly with sex workers. For example, all the uh, quantitative data was collected by sex workers who were hired as research assistants. They collected 299 questionnaires. In total, 308 sex workers participated in a study through questionnaires, in-depth interviews, focus group discussions, led by Marielle Kluck, the main researcher. Before we're gonna present you some of the data from our research, it is important um, to understand a little bit more uh, about the context of sex work in the Netherlands. Sex work itself has always been legal, provided it was voluntary and above the age of 18. Since 2000, the ban on brothel keeping was lifted, meaning that sex clubs, brothels and escort services are legal businesses, but subordinated to a local license system. Reasons for lifting the ban on brothel keeping were foremostly the control and the regulation of the sex industry to make it safer. On municipality level, they formulate their policies, they implement these policies and coordinate the administration of this uh, license system. Consequently, municipalities differ greatly in their approach and practices when it comes to sex work. Unfortunately, since the legislation in 2000, the number of licensed businesses have been decreased enormously. And many of the sex workers have started working outside the licensed industry. This is due to the difficult process of keeping and receiving a license, but also due to the increase of internet use in the Netherlands. To make things worse, since a couple of years, new rep rep repressive legislation proposals have been discussed, such as the criminalization of clients, increasing the minimum age to 21, and privacy invading registration systems. Okay, first of all, um, what I would like to address and what is really problematic in here is that I'm one of the few sex workers who are attending panels and who can sit here, who can tell the narratives of the people who are in key populations where we all work for. Key populations are underrepresented at this conference, uh, especially people who are really in the intersections as well, such as trans people, LGBT sex workers, and, um, and so on. So I really want to make, point that out before I start. It is problematic and we all need to claim that as well with the upcoming um, uh, uh, International AIDS Conference in San Francisco, we as sex workers cannot be attending. So I think this needs to be set prior to when I start. Thank you. So we all work together on this uh, fantastic report that shows that sex work and violence in the Netherlands are existing. We face emotional violence, um, and emotional violence, for example, is when you work in a, in, in a red light district where you ha work licensed, you have so many tourists who come, come by with their own uh, ideas about sex work and the stigmas attached to it, so they spit on you, they will uh, look nasty at you, they make comments. Um, so this is really uh, a major thing, which is very, very bad for us. Um, and um, as well, Bureau of Tax. So it might be, sound strange, but also they have very invasive questions and uh, they, they're really coming into, your, um, into us as it feels like uh, emotional violence. Physical violence, it might be clear that sex workers who face violence through clients um, can be, for example, just like um, when you are having a client, client, but it's especially when you work without a license and you have clients. Uh, as we all heard um, in the Netherlands, there are more sex workers who, who cannot get access to um, spaces where you can work with a license. So here is an, a real warning issue. Then we have the financial violence that even though, though sex work is illegal, sex workers are often excluded 
of financial means or possibilities, such as opening um, business accounts at the bank. And it turned out to be very difficult as well, or impossible even, for sex workers. But we also collected stories of sex workers that were evicted from their home. And we see that daily at Proud. Um, municipalities do raids and then uh, people are really evicted, uh, which is actually not possible uh, with the law that we have. So we need to go every time to, um, to court with our sex workers to, to get them um, not evicted. Okay, cool. Sex workers who operate outside the authorized circles are at a significantly higher risk. And I just point out here the work location and male and trans sex workers. Um, the locations, um, that is due to, let's say, the unlicensed um, uh, spots. So we work from hotels, we work uh, sometimes from, uh, from the outside or from our ho homes. And male and trans sex workers, because of the stigmas, um, especially uh, what I know from my narrative as a trans sex worker is that clients often do have sex with you or you were on the highest rank when it comes to search, for example, on Google uh, or uh, looking for sex workers. And there is a lot of uh, potential sex workers, uh, uh, trans people. Uh, as soon as people have been with us, uh, it can turn into very bad things like violence because the stigma with the client and he faces again, he has to go outside again, people are looking uh, where if you have a trans person uh, where you have sex with, so the violence can turn immediately to, um, to really bad things. And we all know that uh, uh, trans women, especially sex workers, are the highest uh, ranked persons uh, murdered each year. Let me go here because this is the law enforcement slide. Um, while almost all resp respondents were exposed to one of more forms of violence in the past year, only a very limited number of them reported this to the police. Only one in five. An important reason indicated is that sex workers want to remain anonymous. They fear that reporting will have adverse consequences. Moreover, they are afraid that the police do not take them seriously or that there is no use in filling a report. Sex workers indicate that customers know that a sex worker will not report violence easily and there is a risk that clients take advantage of this. The laws and policies in the Netherlands concerning sex work do not protect sex workers, but have detrimental consequences for their safety. The threshold for reporting the violence to the police is very high, partly due to current legislation and licensed prostitution also plays a role in this. But also the fact that there are fewer licensed workplaces and the possibility sex workers who want to work independently are very limited. As a result, many sex workers work outside the licensed circuit and their access to employment law is limited, which increases the risk of violence and exploitation. And then we come to the conclusion, legislation um, in conclusion, even though sex work is uh, legalized and the intensity and quantity of violence and stigma experienced in the Netherlands are lower than in many other countries, we do face many difficulties that are directly related to the implementation of the Dutch leg legislation system. On one hand, sex workers in the license setting experience high level of stigma where privacy is challenged and sometimes they are not sufficiently supported or violated by the establishment owner who is afraid to lose their license. On the other hand, you have sex workers that work more underground without a permit who have a higher chance of facing more physical violence by clients and are, are too afraid to report these cases to police. So uh, in regard to the trans sex workers, uh, there's actually almost none uh, no possibility in the Netherlands to work uh, with a license. Um, and so this is really a uh, large problem as well for male sex workers. We recommend the following involve and support sex worker movement and empower sex workers for their own protection. Lower the threshold when it comes to filling a report and decriminalize sex work in order to provide access to labor rights for all sex workers and to reduce the risk of violence. This recommendation can also be found in the document, The Legal Facade, 
which we was handed yesterday to the municipality after our sex workers demonstration march. Thank you. Um, we're all keeping to time really, really well. Our next presenter is uh, Elena Argento from Canada, and she's the research associate at the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS and a PhD student at the University of British Columbia. Her research investigates the socio-structural determinants of HIV risk among sex workers, including the impact of criminalization on health and human rights. Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. It is an honor to present this study conducted with the Gender and Sexual Health Initiative in Vancouver, Canada. I declare no conflict of interest and I acknowledge this work was conducted on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Following a global wave of end-demand policies, which criminalized the purchase of sex while leaving the sale of sex legal, and in the absence of any science to support this model, in late 2014, Canada implemented new end-demand legislation known as the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, or the PCEPA. This criminalized approach to sex work is also known as the Nordic model, based on legislation in Norway, Sweden, and other European countries, that aims to eradicate sex work by ending the demand for sexual services. The PCEPA also includes funding for sex, work, sex workers, but only if they are focused on exiting the trade, much like the anti-prostitution pledge. And this is a major concern, given that community empowerment has been shown to be key to preventing violence and HIV. The new legislation also comes after the Supreme Court of Canada decision in 2013 that struck down former anti-prostitution laws on the basis that they were a violation of sex workers' constitutional rights. Canada's federal government proceeded to implement the PCEPA despite this decision based on strong evidence that criminalization of sex work undermines the health and human rights of sex workers, not just in Canada but globally. The new legislation Legislation has also been criticized for conflating sex workers with victims of violence and trafficking, not to mention that there is no acknowledgement of any gender diversity among sex workers in the legislation. We know that the legal environment is a key structural determinant of health and has immense potential to shape the health and well-being of those most marginalized in society, such as sex workers. Substantial research and evidence worldwide demonstrate that criminalization of sex work perpetuates stigma and discrimination, widespread forms of violence and abuse, and increases risk of HIV and other STIs. This stigma and discrimination creates further barriers to accessing safe and non-judgmental health and support services and housing, and leads to an overall fear of police and distrust of healthcare providers. Criminalization also hinders the ability of sex workers to organize, and this is important because collectivization of workers has been shown to be critical to empowering sex workers to negotiate safe, safer work environments. This evidence has led numerous human rights and public health experts such as the WHO, UNAIDS, and Am Am Amnesty International, along with sex work communities, to endorse full decriminalization of sex work. In the lead-up to the PCEPA, members of our team published mixed methods work evaluating the policing practices in Vancouver that targeted clients. And the findings revealed that this end-demand approach really reproduces the same harms created by previous models of criminalization by perpetuating mistrust of police, rushing the screening of potential clients, and continuing to displace sex workers to riskier, more isolated areas of the city where sex workers are at increased risk of violence. In the context of limited data on these end-demand models, the aim of our study was to longitudinally evaluate the impact of the PCPA on sex workers' access to health and sex worker-led support services in Vancouver, Canada. Data for this study were drawn from AISHA, which is a community-based 
prospective cohort of over 900 street and off-street sex workers across Metro Vancouver since 2010. Since the start of the project, sex workers are included in all aspects of the research, from frontline interview outreach staff, research nurses, coordinators, to partners and co-authors. Participants are cis and trans women who have exchanged sex for money in the last 30 days. And participants complete interviewer administered questionnaires at enrollment and biannually, as well as voluntary HIV, STI, and hepatitis C testing. Aisha also has a community advisory board that spans over 15 women's health, sex work, and HIV agencies. Our prospective analysis draws on data over eight years and used the primary exposure of the PCEPA post-law reform versus pre-law reform. So the period between 2015 and 2017 versus 2010 and 2013. We use logistic regression, generalized estimating equations, and a working correlation matrix to account for repeated measures by the same respondent to examine how sex workers' access to services were affected after the implementation of these new laws. Since the former laws were struck down in December of 2013, but the PCEPA was not officially passed until the end of 2014, we dropped 2014 from the analysis to, to reduce any potential variation in how the law may have been enforced during that phase. We were interested in two main time updated outcomes. We wanted to know whether or not sex workers could access health services when needed, which was defined as more than 75% of the time, and whether or not sex workers accessed any sex worker-led services or supports, including drop-ins, outreach programs, and support groups. Of the total 854 participants, 18% were not able to access health services when needed post-PCEPA compared to 13% pre-PCPA. 69% accessed a sex work service or community-led supports post-PCEPA, compared to 77% before the laws were implement implemented. The median age at baseline was 35, and as you can see, gender and sexual minorities and indigenous women are highly overrepresented among sex workers in Vancouver, each making up more than a third of the sample. About half of the participants solicited clients on the street or outdoors, and another half solicited clients either from indoor venues or independently, such as brothels, in-call, or online. We ran separate multivariable confounder models to examine the relationship between the new laws and the outcomes of interest. In the final models, we found that after the PCEPA was implemented, sex workers had reduced access to health services and sex worker-led supports. Specifically, sex workers had a 23% reduced odds of accessing these services post-PCPA. We also found that sex workers had a 41% reduced odds of having access to health services when needed. And there was no evidence of increased access to HIV care among sex workers living with HIV following the new laws. So despite one of the goals of end-demand approaches being to increase access to services for sex workers, on the contrary, our study found that sex workers had significantly reduced access to health and community-led support services after the PCEPA was implemented. Our study is the first in Canada and among the first globally to longitudinally evaluate the impact of end-demand laws on sex workers' access to health and community services. As with other emerging research, including a new report from France that we're hearing about today, our findings suggest that end-demand criminalization replicates risks and harms to sex workers. Much like PEPFAR's anti-prostitution pledge, the PCEP PCEPA in Canada reduces access to sex worker-led services and ultimately limits resources to support community empowerment. There are some good examples of legislative reform in New Zealand and parts of Australia where sex work has been decriminalized, and as a result, they have seen benefits to health and safety among workers. In conclusion, it is critical that legal inter interventions and policies be guided by the evidence, which demonstrates that criminalization of sex work, including end-demand models such as the PCEPA in Canada, 
does not improve sex workers' access to health services and exacerbates barriers to accessing health and community services. Our study also adds evidence to support global calls for full decriminalization to ensure labor and human rights for sex workers, including access to critical health services and supports. I would like to acknowledge all of the women who participated in this study, the Community Advisory Board, and the research support at the Gender and Sexual Health Initiative, as well as our funding support from the National Institutes of Health, Open Society Foundation, and MacAIDS, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research that supports my PhD work. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now invite Helene Labai and Carlo Giamette. Um, Helene is from the Paris Institute of Political Studies and Carlo is from the Marseille University. So thanks a lot and thank you to Helena to introduce the next presentation which is uh, about uh, the impact of the criminalization of sex workers clients in France. Uh, so we, we are going to present the, the some results of this survey uh, that uh, was done in order to evaluate the impact of such a law on sex workers' health, security, and exposure to uh, uh, HIV. <coughs> so just a few words about the background. First, uh, uh, between 2003 uh, until 2016, the French law prohibited public soliciting and uh, third-party involvement in sex work is also criminalized. As of April 2016, so uh, the soliciting was decriminalized and France criminalized sex workers' clients as part of a new legislation aimed at fighting against what they call the prostitutional system, which is la largely inspired by the Swedish or Nordic model. So the, as I said just before, the research objective is to evaluate the impact of such a uh, new law. So uh, now a few words about the methodology. So uh, the research period is from the beginning of the law when the law was passed in April 2016 until this uh, January, uh, almost two years. It's a mixed methodology, but the core, the very core of the survey was a qualitative uh, survey with uh, semi-structured interviews. And then uh, this January, we added a more qualitative survey with a questionnaire. Then it was a collaborative research. Uh, 13 organizations participated in a steering committee and they also participated in, the, in collecting the data. And we, the two uh, social scientists, led the survey and uh, wrote the report. Uh, among these organizations, you had some uh, community-based organizations <coughs> and a sex workers group uh, along with uh, health NGOs. So what uh, are the data we collected? So as I said, the core of the data is qualitative. So it's based on 70 in-depth qualitative interviews. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, people, among the interviewees, uh, we were able to uh, collect interviews from men and women and trans persons. Uh, we covered 15 different nationalities. Uh, so it means that we had interviews from documented and undocumented migrants along with French people. Uh, we uh, collected interviews from street workers and indoor workers, uh, and uh, we collected interviews in nine different cities in France and also in rural areas. Uh, we also uh, added to that uh, focus groups and uh, 38 more sex workers, so different sex workers participated in these uh, focus groups. It was uh, all migrants focus groups. And uh, we also collected 24 interviews with organizations working with sex workers or sex workers groups uh, uh, in different cities of France. Uh, so regarding the 
quantitative part of the survey, so that was realized this January, we collected 583 replies to uh, a questionnaire. So we'll move to the results. Okay, so <clears throat> first and foremost, um, I would like to say that the title of the report is What Do Sex Workers Think About the French Prostitution <coughs> Act? Um, as we wanted to highlight uh, the importance of putting the people who are directly concerned uh, at the center of the analysis and not at the margins, obviously. Um, so through this study on the criminalization of uh, the demand, we paid attention to the interconnection of all the detrimental aspects uh, that we saw emerge from people's experiences and what they told us uh, under this new legal framework. So uh, I would say that the most direct effect that we um, assessed from, from our study is that uh, sex workers have been uh, put through an acute increase of their socioeconomic vulnerability. Uh, but then this vulnerability then intersects with other factors such as uh, an increase of violence, um, worse working conditions, and a subsequent negative impact on their health, both physical and mental. So here there is a graphic representation of what uh, I was referring to, um, what we defined as sex workers' multifactorial vulnerabilities um, under this new criminalizing law in France since 2016. Um, so a reduced income, unfortunately, is not the only uh, consequences of this law. Sex workers are also affected by a reduced negotiating power with their clients uh, because clients fear of being uh, caught by the police. Um, uh, then uh, a more dangerous, uh, definitely more dangerous working conditions and a felt necessity to take more risks on the part of the sex worker. An increase, uh, for, uh, increased form of stigma and violence as the media representation becomes more and more polarized on the subject. Uh, and finally, this obviously all results, as you can see here uh, on the graph, on uh, an impact on uh, a negative impact on sex workers' physical and mental health. So. For questions of time, here we can only focus on the impact on physical health, uh, but it is very important to bear in mind that many of the organizations we talked to reported unprecedented data on suicide attempts and intentions uh, of the sex workers they, they, they supported. So stress level, anxiety, depression were very much reported uh, as to be um, more likely since 2016. Um, so sex workers do find it increasingly difficult to negotiate safe sex pra practices and here we can say 38% of the people we, uh, that complete, who completed the survey uh, encounter increased difficulties negotiating condom use. Um, so the decreasing number of clients and the fact that they see themselves as taking risks under the law has given clients more power to uh, negotiate unsafe sexual <coughs> practices. And also the fact that uh, people have less time uh, to negotiate, so the, the, the actual like, lack of time uh, available for the, uh, the sex worker has made it harder for the uh, person, for the sex worker, to impose uh, her own, his own uh, conditions. And then, uh, last but not least, in terms of the, the second result that we wanted to mention today, um, is that um, it's, it's linked to the necessity of, of for the, from the, on the part of the sex workers of having to work more uh, or in different places, including in different cities, in order to make the same money that we're making before the law in 2016. Um, so the increased mobility of sex workers results in the difficulty of accessing health services and in particular treatment for HIV positive uh, sex workers. So here there is a quote uh, from uh, a participant uh, from Accepteste, which is a, a trans-led sex workers organization in Paris. Uh, and here the participant says, sex workers are increasingly mobile. HIV positive people, uh, HIV positive sex workers stop their treatment when they leave Paris to work elsewhere. When they come back to Paris, their state of health is sometimes deplorable, almost at the point of AIDS. 
And uh, this is just an example, but we gathered quite a few of these comments from uh, a number of other sex workers. And now we go to the conclusions. So just to conclude, uh, so sex workers are a key population in the fight against HIV, and our research clearly demonstrates the negative consequences of the criminalization of clients on sex workers' ability to practice safe sex and prevent HIV infection. So uh, while it's still too early to evaluate the impact uh, in terms of HIV infection, uh, we, s we have some, um, uh, some, some health NGOs already point to an increase in some other uh, STIs, uh, notably syphilis, among sex workers in France. Um, okay, so that was just a, a, a small aspect of all the results we have in the survey. Uh, you can find uh, the full survey report in French uh, on, the, uh, on the web, but you can also find a summary which is available in English, and we hope to have the, soon the full report in English. Thank you very much. So we'd like to open up the session now for questions from the floor for any of the panelists. If you'd like to come forward to a mic. Hello. So I'm Thierry, I'm a sex worker. Um, yeah, I had a, a question about the, um, because I heard uh, on several occasions um, the, the problem of violence from clients. And uh, at least in France, we had a discussion about how do we define really um, uh, this type of violence, because often what we notice is that we, there are many men who pose as clients, but we are not, uh, because... Um, you know, if their, if their intention is not to pay us, their intention is to have sex for free. And so uh, we often said, but it's like if there's someone who rob a bank and you're not going to say it's a client of the bank, he's just here to steal the money. Um, and so I know it, it, it may be difficult because uh, sometimes it's difficult to make the difference, but uh, I think it's important to point it out because then it's often used against us to say, oh, you see, your, the, um, a lot of violence comes from clients, of bad people, and all, and, and all that. When I think maybe we need to be more uh, specific uh, when we denounce this type, of, this type of violence. Yeah, ma you want, maybe I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to speak to Van France again, but um, indeed in the survey it's very clear that most of the viol violence, and as we said, it has increased, is not so much coming for, from the clients, but it's coming from the passers-by in the streets, so that's everyday violence. And, and then you have uh, all these people trying to have uh, access to the services without paying. And also, how to say, and also the... Yes, yes, it's also we noticed that the, um, there is a, a sort of taking advantage of the situations of migrant sex workers uh, who uh, find it very difficult to find uh, accommodation um, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, and and uh, so there is, there is a high risk there where people uh, go into the, the houses uh, pretending to be clients and then actually uh, stealing from them. So th there is uh, definitely an aug augmentation of this sort of, uh, of violence. Can I say something? I also would like to add, because I, I totally agree with, uh, with Thierry, but for the specific group of the trans uh, sex workers, there, is, um, um, there are a lot of men that come to us that are actually um, pretty good clients when they're a client, but afterwards there is this sort of like issue about transphobia, and then it turns into, it can turn in, into really bad things, especially if there is a discussion about like, are you clean, which means like, are you, are you uh, having HIV? And if I do not respond correctly or not fast enough, or I'm just like, you know, busy with other things in my mind, this client might think, and I had, had, had several cases that you get beaten up because um, they think, okay, you must be HIV positive. So then you um, have the conflict of, uh, of, another thi of another stigma again. So I think this is, 
we need to define these things very well, and we in, in next research definitely we need to tailor it down more on the specific types of sex work. I think that's very necessary, and especially the most vulnerable in those key populations, such as trans women, um, uh, MSM. We really need to focus harder on that. I agree. Maybe if I could just add a point as well, in the context where we did our study, although we didn't measure that type of violence, when we did the police ethnography, a lot of police talked about the fact that kind of theft for services was very common and they really didn't take it seriously at all and talked about it in very, very dismissive terms. So it came up very much in our qualitative side of the study and it's a really important point. And do any of the other panelists want to comment? I want to comment shortly. Yeah. I think when uh, looking to the Netherlands, clients came out as one of the main perpetrators. When, but we also did the same research in five southern African countries, and there it was mostly the police. Mm -hmm. And there we had many, many stories of um, people pointing out, actually, as clients, but they were not. They were just perpetrators uh, who, who, who came up as one person, as a client, but then like a whole fan full of other men joined. So that's... Sometimes it's then hard to see in your surveys, so is this now a client or not? So then it falls on the client. So I, I agree with you. You need to be more subtle in defining that. I, I think it's not only the academic evidence that shows that it's not clients necessarily are the main perpetrators. So there's been research done in Eastern Europe by sex workers through SWAN, the sex worker network there, through ASWA. Um, the African Sex Worker Alliance and all of the studies done by my communities around the world show that it's actually law enforcement officers and uniform men who are the main perpetrators of violence. And I think these are the very people that are meant to protect us. That's their job, is to protect all the citizens, all the human beings in countries. And yet they are the main perpetrators and they get away with that perpetration of extreme abuse and violence against us with absolute impunity because they're the people that are meant to enforce the law. And there are groups that are particularly vulnerable, so trans sex workers, drug-using sex workers, people with intersectionality with multiple layers of stigma and discrimination and exclusion that we really need to be thinking very, very hard about. So we'll take next question. I'd like to thank you to the uh, presenters. My name is Mika from UNFPA. Uh, my question is at the organizational level. I am now seeing and understanding there are a lot of like, research and advocacy is ongoing toward the decriminalization of the sex work at the country uh, level. But uh, for UNFPA, regardless of the fact that uh, we are supporting and working hand in hand with um, sex work organizations uh, you, due to the UN staff policy or like due to the code of conduct, UN staff is not allowed to actually pursue sex at any place of the world. And then I think many international organizations, I think, follow the same. So as an entry point or like from any of you, if you have any idea like how to actually you know, address this at the organization level. I'd like to appreciate your opinion or advice. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. Are, are you asking uh, for advice on of staff of I UN? Mean, like that the policy, goes? yeah, because like the UN, like we mm -hmm. are not, I mean, staff is not allowed to purchase sex. Of course, this is, again, like a transactional sex. Of course, that we are really conflict understanding, you know, we should mm -hmm. not mix up with the tra uh, trafficking, but this transactional sex, sex work, is there any way that we can actually, uh, how do you say, uh, break this UN staff policy? Or I, I understand, because we have the same policy at eight funds, uh, and, mm -hmm. and partly I understand uh, because you are a donor, so I, I'm not allowed to have sex with uh, any of my partners because there is a power imbalance. So I, we have that something like I this. think it's a little bit different, Sally, sorry. So all UN staff are prohibited from purchasing sex anywhere in the world. 
Yeah, I think that should be changed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have like any advice, like how, like I mean, I'm sure not only UN but also like other international organizations are like Oxfam, like the Red same. Cross, Medicine Sans Frontieres. Yeah. You are all tracking stuff. Sorry, I'm muttering to myself here. Um, so many of you will have heard about the cases of Oxfam, the Red Cross, as well as Médecins Sans Frontier, who are sacking staff for purchasing sex with actually little evidence of any abuse of actual power or extortion of sexual services. They're simply being sacked for purchasing sex in a consensual adult sex sexual relationships. And I think we do need to challenge it. Um, I'm maybe going to let the academics say there, and then I will have quite a bit to say. Does anybody else want to comment? Because it is, I mean, it is a very hot issue just now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is all about just morality, and in, and, and, and in a world where sexuality is just like something which is so totally not it is very intertwining with the way people are looking at us i mean it's really about a stigma some some how people think of uh, sex work in general and i think it's really appealing to me yes i mean i would add to that exactly it sort of contributes feeds into the the stigma of course and and it kind of contributes to conflate it with uh, the idea that sex work uh, in itself is inherently violent, so therefore, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that needs a bit of a change. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I have been involved in, in looking at some of the recent cases, not in detail in terms of individuals, but at the impact on our community more broadly. And increasingly, I'm hearing in different environments the term sexual exploitation being linked with sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, and abuse of power, where the purchasing of sex is being rolled into that completely, which takes away the agency of every single sex worker there, which is actually about removing our livelihoods. And I think that one of the things that I was very happy to hear in your report, the descriptions of the impact on our economic livelihood so what you're talking about is taking away how I put a roof over my family, how I feed my family, how I pay for my kids to go to school, or I choose to buy Dior shoes, okay? Because we all have different lifestyles and different choices. And what this legislation is aiming to do, and the UN policy, because UN staff get paid a lot of money, they're usually very good clients. Yeah. yeah. Um, taking away the money that I need to live. And I don't know of any other industry or form of labor where we do that. I come from a mining family in Wales. And when there were so many deaths and children down the pits in Wales 100 years ago, we didn't say we're not going to use coal anymore. We looked at health and safety within that industry. And I think we need to have a radical reshift of thinking about this. None of us want exploitation. None of us want abuse. None of us will support forced labor or trafficking by the definition of the Palerno Protocol, not the national legislations. And so we have to start thinking about this within a labor framework and what are the solutions, because it's not about eradicating sex work. Hello. That was great. Thank you, Ruth. I come from a um, family who um, recycled, recycling family. Mm -hmm. and nobody asked if people uh, got insured or something. It's, mm -hmm. it's a job mm -hmm. to survive or to have a good life. It's, it can be like this, can be like this. So my name is Christine. I'm a new member of the Tampa Steering Committee. I'm very happy and proud to be here. Also, I'm uh, involved in the Austrian sex worker movement. Greetings to you. And um, I know 
I always say the same. Uh, I, I just want to point out that in Austria we have the compulsory health checks still, and I made a poster, it has the number 511, together with sex workers where you can see how the experiences are. And in these days, I stay here, I got a call from a sex worker, and she said, oh, I have to go home. Uh, my mother died, but the brothel owner, he will, he will not let me out. And I said, how? Because uh, it's like this, you go to the health check, you get the license, like the Beatles said a long time ago, the ticket to write. And uh, um, uh, yes, it's, it's in this old Beatles song. And it's a long time ago, and we still have it. It's uh, from the time of Maria Theresia and from Hitler, this license. And it sounds nice in this Beatles song, but in reality, it's very inhuman and and you can't believe how the conditions they are. This health check takes 40 seconds and sometimes sex workers are insured and the brothel owners, they take those licenses and uh, when the police comes, uh, the, they, the police accept it that the brothel owners have this document from the sex workers and if a sex worker wants to go, he will not get the license if the uh, if the brothel owner doesn't agree. And it's not so easy to get a new license because you have to wait. And so I all ask you who are sitting here, please, what can we do against this? Austria has not only Apostrudel and Wiener Walzer and uh, Nice Time, we have these inhuman measures. And please, I ask, I'm only coming from a small town, uh, but I have a lot of sex workers behind me, and I'm a sex worker also, but not legal. I don't need a license. Uh, <laughs> and, and therefore, I ask you for su support. What can you do? I think uh, what we can do, well, we, we are as well organized um, at the ICRZ, International Committee for Sex Work Rights in Europe. I think we, and I'm a board member there, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something that we need to pick up together with your community there. I think that's, that's one of the things. And as well within NSWP, there is uh, availability to, to, to work on this together jointly. So I would suggest to do that. And as well to then see what the platforms are within the communities that you are in for example, with uh, health foundations or uh, uh, civil rights th uh, movements. If it's not working, it should be just us. I'd also remind us that WHO guidelines say that mandatory registration and testing is a human rights violation. Mm -hmm. They have been saying that for many years. And I think that we need to hold our governments to account to uphold the human rights of all sex workers. Um, certainly, we would be happy to write a statement for you to present to the Austrian government. Yes, um, I have a meeting Citing all of the September. evidence. Yeah. Thank happy you. Happy to, Christine. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I would like to ask about uh, residence of sex workers. Uh, for example, in Japan, uh, it's really difficult to approach a house. Uh, because of the stigma, and uh, actually the kind of company to pri uh, provide a fake, uh, fake address or occupation for sex workers. And uh, uh, I would like to ask about, is there any kinds of company to provide uh, like a fake address or occupation for housing, or could be a daycare for sex workers' children? Uh, Did anybody get the question? We, we don't have that in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, and, but we also have an issue in the Netherlands with housing because we have uh, sex workers who are evicted from their house because there are sex workers. So we also have that issue. I don't know how they solve it, mostly by friends and the community I itself, but we don't have a a daycare where they register with, with a different job. What they do do, however, because the sex workers need to register with the tax, uh, the tax office, and often they make their job description very vague. 
it doesn't say sex worker, but it says mm. uh, masseur or uh, counselor or something fake. This is what they do, I think, to prevent. I do think it's one of the very serious challenges that sex workers face because of the stigma and discrimination. I think that in terms of travel, there are some sex worker organizations, so Zitang in Hong Kong, actually produce a document, a booklet, that explains to sex workers how you can migrate legally to other countries. I think that information is very often not available for people who are wanting to move and migrate. I think it's also an interesting idea to look at, well, how can we produce those nationally and give guidance? I think you have real difficulty when you start to talk about a company that facilitates this, because it would be seen as trafficking. Okay. Um, and that that, I think, would put many, many companies off. I think it's what makes us vulnerable when we wish to migrate or when we experience extreme stigma and discrimination within our countries. And I'm not sure any of us up here have a solution yet, other than changing the laws to full decrim around the world. Yeah? Sorry. Yeah, I'm Flavio, a supporter of sex workers movement in Brazil, journalist. Before I translate Lourdes, I just wanted to raise something. We have seen here the impact of legislation on, on sex work. Do you have good expectations about the impact of research on legislation? Just to think about it. Bom dia para todos e todas. Eu sou Lúcio Barreto, sou trabalhadora sexual do Brasil e também uma das fundadoras, junto com Gabriela Leite, da Rede Brasileira de Prostituta. I'm, I'm Luiz Barreto, sex worker from Brazil and founder of the movement with Gabriela Leite in Brazil. A pesquisa que foi feita no Brasil pela Fricruz é, deu 4.0 de trabalhadores sexuais com HIV e nós, e nós no Brasil, as trabalhadoras sexuais, que articulou com o governo para trabalhar em pares em vários municípios do estado do Brasil. Uh, research in Brazil uh, show that prevalence among sex workers are around 4% and uh, we have been working the sex workers with a very close partnership with government creating policies about uh, HIV prevention and treatment. Mesmo a gente no Brasil estando vivendo um, uma violência política e cultural uma violência social com esse governo golpista, a gente conseguiu três redes de trabalhadoras sexuais estar aqui presente nessa conferência e eu ouvi outra companheira falando que, infelizmente, as conferências mundiais, como eu assisti de outra, não tem trabalhadoras sexuais falando nas mesas sobre sendo protagonista da sua própria história. Even though we're uh, living under a very political and cultural violence in Brazil nowadays, we are able to, to bring three uh, networks of sex workers uh, from Brazil here, and I have seen that you were complaining about the lack of sex workers in the conferences. Como a Rede Umbrella está aqui, que tem fortalecido vários países do, do mundo na questão da auto-organização e de luta por identidade, também na linha de direitos humanos. Eu queria agradecer muito de estar aqui, eu também estou com a companheira trabalhadora sexual, que é a Betânia também, que é do Brasil, e dizer para vocês que no Brasil, nós, em 83, no início dos casos de AIDS do Brasil, nós que dissemos para o governo como duas prostitutas, eu e Gabriela, como se trabalhia, ia trabalhar em pares para trabalhar a prevenção da AIDS. Eu gostaria de dizer para vocês que nós estamos trabalhando no Brasil em uma relação muito partnership com o governo, e desde o começo, nós fomos capazes de fazer todas essas criar todas essas políticas. Entendo que é importante, eu, eu queria pe perguntar para Canadá, França, Estados Unidos e Austrália, que está aí presente, que se tem organizações políticas das trabalhadoras sexuais nesses países, porque o que eu entendo como Brasil, 
que onde você tem organização política, por exemplo, lá no Brasil e na América Latina, onde você tem organização política, a violência policial ela, ela, ela é menor. Ainda é velada porque é uma violência de estigma e de preconceito e de discriminação contra as trabalhadoras sexuais do Brasil e do mundo e da América Latina. E eu gostaria de perguntar a todos vocês sobre as organizações políticas that work in partnership in all these researches and, and, and how these political organizations can reduce, uh, contribute to reduce stigma and violence as it happens in Brazil. Como eu sou uma puta de quase 80 anos, vou estar convidando outra colega para dividir a fala aqui, as perguntas, né? mas eu queria depois sentar e ouvir as perguntas e dizer para vocês que eu estou muito feliz de estar aqui, que é mais um, um momento de expressar que as trabalhadoras sexuais não é problema, sim solução para toda a sociedade mundial. Beijo. E, desde que eu sou uma de quase 80 anos, eu quero compartilhar também uh, com a minha jovem colega do Brasil e dizer para ela que eu estou muito feliz de estar aqui e lhe dar um beijo. Bom, eu não vou fazer bem pergunta, mas vou fazer um pedido, pois vejo que nesta, é, neste momento nós estamos vivendo um momento de pedido de união para a descriminalização do trabalho sexual. Não é uma pergunta, é uma demanda que estamos vivendo neste Pois nós somos trabalhadores como qualquer um outro, qualquer uma outra função, não vítimas desse trabalho. Nós exercemos a nossa profissão por pura opção. Because we're not victims, we're doing our work because we want to do it. Então, esse é um pedido de uma trabalhadora sexual do Brasil para que unamos forças pela descriminalização do nosso trabalho. And so this is a request from a sex worker from Brazil that we, jo we join force forces around the decriminalization of our work. Obrigado. Okay, I think we're over time. Thank you, everyone. I think we should just join together and thank our amazing presenters uh, before we finish. Thank you. I'd just like to say, um, I think it's really good as somebody who's in involved in research, but also research translation, seeing this growing body of evidence, um, certainly over the last decade, we did some stuff on the impact of UN conventions uh, and aggressive policing of sex workers in Cambodia, um, in, yeah, almost a decade ago, and nothing has changed there. But I think if we can build this evidence base, we're in a much better position to try and yeah, change this, not only regressive laws, but also yeah, the over-policing of sex workers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would, I would ask you to stand with us on AIDS 2020, not in Trump's America. <laughs> <laughs>